these three nations, Anishinaabe, Mississauga, and Haudenosaunee, that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent indigenous, indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. Since we are on, online in this digital world, many of us may not necessarily be in Toronto or Takaronto. So whatever you are, we urge you to just take a moment, ground yourself and learn who are the indigenous peoples of the city that you're on. We invite you to go to www.native-land.ca. We're gonna put it in the chat. Uh, you know, take a moment at your own time and just learn about the, the peoples, um, the original peoples. So then you can do the work the study that you do with a little more grounding. After we um, have completed this land acknowledgement, I would like to go ahead and um, invite our main speaker for today, who is Bill Reed. Bill Reed provides legal consultation to students free of charge. Our legal advice covers everything from family law, immigration, criminal law, to real estate and business. And one of the things that uh, the members at CESAR uh, uh, really appreciate is the fact that they have sometimes to have a lot of documents especially if they come from overseas, that they have to be notarized, they have to be, you know, going through the proper process to make them official. So that process was always being one of the things students welcome because they don't have to pay or dish extra money going somewhere else. They can actually connect with Bill. And Bill was just recently telling me that a lot of that, those processes also have switched to online. So having said that, I'm going to leave you in the capable hands of Bill and I'm just gonna close my screen. Well, thank you again, Janet. And um, so today we are talking about tenancy situations and uh, many of them are covered by the Residential Tenancies Act. And uh, the act actually applies first and foremost to self-contained apartments. Now, self-contained apartments may be in high rises, but they may be in other situations as well that are not so typical, such as basement units. However, basement units um, may be self-contained and may not. So uh, the, um, the Act very strictly applies to self-contained apartments, be they in high rises or low rises, or uh, a house or part of a house if it is self-contained, such as a basement but only self-contained units. Now those units then are governed by the Residential Tenancies Act and the Landlord and Tenant Board, which the Act establishes. There are then situations to which the Act does not apply, primarily those in which the landlord shares a washroom and or a kitchen with a tenant or tenants. Uh, and there are then situations where people uh, live and have either possibly a room or a whole floor such as a basement, but they still may share the kitchen uh, with the landlord or they may share a washroom with, uh, with the landlord. And so these situations in theory are not covered by the Act. Now, if they're not covered by the Act, it doesn't make it a bad thing. The Residential Tenancies Act is not slanted toward benefiting tenants. It is intended to be even-handed. It is somewhat, um, but to not be covered by the act is not necessarily a bad thing either. It simply means that the tenant and the whole situation are governed by contract law. It is therefore important to have an agreement with a landlord with whom you share a washroom or kitchen uh, as to what exactly the situation is, how long the tenancy is, when you pay, how frequently, what kind of notice either party can give to terminate. It's just very important to have all of those things in a written agreement. And then it's, it can be just as good as 
having a unit that is governed by the act and the board. Now, some situations, it may be difficult to know whether the situation is governed by the act or not. I said about uh, sharing a washroom and or a kitchen. Some situations will be very obvious that a uh, tenant shares the washroom and kitchen with the landlord. Other situations may be more gray, more ambiguous. Uh, for example, whether there's a main kitchen and a kitchenette and the tenant has the kitchenette, but maybe sometimes can use the kitchen or the landlord has a washroom, but may sometimes use the washroom that's in the tenant's area. In those situations, there's nothing illegal about that. It may be fine to have a kitchenette and sometimes use the landlord's wash, uh, sorry, uh, kitchen. May be fine that the landlord has a washroom but sometimes uses the one in the tenant's area. There's, there's nothing illegal about that. Uh, except that the parties need to realize that in that kind of a situation, it may not be so clear whether the situation is governed by the Residential Tenancies Act or not. And it's not up to the parties to, uh, certainly either one of them to declare that, to say, well, here's what the situation is. However, also this is, or this is not governed by the act. That statement that the situation is or is not governed by the act doesn't make it so. Uh, what makes it so is the reality of the situation. And if either party files an application to the, uh, to the landlord and tenant board, the landlord and tenant board will be the ones to decide, irrespective of what any agreement or any, any statement and in anything in writing or otherwise may have said, the landlord and tenant board are the ones who will make a decision. This situation is or is not governed by the act and therefore by us, the landlord and tenant board. So uh, I say all that to say that there's a lot to think about and a lot to be clear about. And it's not that some situations are ideal and others are bad. Uh, any situation governed by the act or not may be ideal or it may be bad. So uh, it's just important to have a clear understanding with the landlord and to have things in writing and uh, to have a situation that you both agree on and that you as a tenant feel that you can live with. And we can move on to the next slide. So if the act applies, the government has prescribed a standard form of lease. This was never the case prior to 2018, and I've been uh, advising students for years. So for years, I saw these leases that landlords had drafted, and sometimes much more extensive than necessary, maybe getting into terms that were really only appropriate to a commercial lease, uh, like for a store. Uh, other times, very scant, not saying much, often poorly edited, you know, um, poor spelling and grammar and typographical errors. Uh, and certainly sometimes I search some of those leases contained provisions that were contrary to the law. And the landlords themselves may have known and still put it in. Many cases didn't know because many landlords don't bother to know the law. So, uh, yes, I have seen a very motley assortment of leases over the years. So I understood the government of Ontario and its reasoning in uh, implementing a standard form of lease in 2018 and saying that from now on, uh, tenants had the right to require that a new lease be in this form. It doesn't mean that leases that are not in that form are not legal. The government allows that, but landlords, uh, ideally should use the standard form and tenants have the right to insist that a landlord use the standard form. And I would advise any tenant to do so, to insist that at least be on the standard form. Um, and the government has very slightly tweaked the standard form for leases beginning, I believe it's March 1st of this year. And uh, 
So that's fine. There'll be very minor modifications, but the essential, the uh, essentials of that standard form that's now coming up to three years old remain in place. And I think it's a good thing. The only deposits that a landlord may legally require are the final month's rent. So as one often hears first and last, yes, you gotta pay the first month's rent and also the final month's rent, which the landlord is to hold as a deposit until the final month of the tenancy. The only other deposit that a landlord may legally require is a reasonable key deposit, a deposit uh, on uh, which would be returned when the tenant moves out and returns the keys, but in a reasonable amount, meaning an amount that it would reasonably cost to replace the keys if they're lost. Although that could in some cases include replacing other keys. For example, if a front door that uh, is used by other, other tenants, other, other units, if that key is lost, there may be a need to replace that lock as well. So that could all cost more money. So um, those are the only reason, and only legal deposits, so the final month's rent and the reasonable key deposit. Sometimes landlords do ask for what they call a damage deposit or a security deposit or more than two months rent. And in any of those situations, if a tenant does pay, the tenant may apply to the landlord and tenant board uh, and the board will order that the landlord pay it back. The landlord cannot require a tenant to pay post-dated checks, to give post-dated checks. A um, tenant may choose to do so. Again, it's not illegal, but uh, only if a tenant chooses to, a landlord may not require it. And again, I don't recommend it. There are times when there may be something uh, about the tenancy that the tenant has the right to apply to the landlord and tenant board for a partial reduction in, in rent or early termination. And it's those situations where the tenant will most regret having given posted checks. If, if all goes well, sure, it's convenient. But uh, in a situation in which the tenant is entitled to a rent reduction or early termination because of issues with the tenancy, with the property, with the landlord's conduct, whatever, those are the situations in which the landlord may most resist handing back the post-dated checks, which may mean that the uh, tenant has to go to the bank and put stop payments on them. And the bank takes advantage of that as well. I don't know, I'd say 20 bucks or so. There's different amounts and it, and it varies, but it, uh, it's high. Uh, what banks charge to put a stop payment on a check and if you're given post your checks and there's, you know, what, three, four, six more in the landlord's hands, the bank will charge their, uh, their fee times whatever, three, four, six, as I said. So I don't recommend giving post your checks and the landlord may not require them. And we can move uh, on from there. If a tenant wants to terminate a lease agreement, the tenant may do so at the end of a fixed term or the end of any subsequent rental period. And this is very important. Uh, many tenancies, especially if they are in writing as they should be, especially the uh, standard form of lease provides for this, most leases are for a fixed term. It's not just, well, move in, begin living here, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Most leases begin with a fixed term of usually a year. Let's say someone has agreed to move in March 1st, 2021. The lease will likely say that the tenancy is from March 1st, 2021 until February 28th, 2022. And that is what I'm referring to as the fixed term. Most people have heard about uh, ending a tenancy on 60 days notice. And so many people kind of mistakenly believe that they can terminate a lease anytime on 60 days notice. So people are sometimes mistakenly believe, to use my example, they move in March 1st, 2021, sign the lease that it says it's until February 28th, 2022. But in June, they decide whether they drop out or lose a job or want to move in with a roommate or, or whatever, um, somewhere else. They think they can give 60 days notice. Well, they can't. 
the whole 60 days notice thing, yes, but as, in, as the slide says, at the end of a fixed term or the end of any subsequent rental period. So if you sign that lease for um, from March 1st until next February 28th, you can't give 60 days notice in June. Can't give it in September, October. Uh, the earliest you can give it is as of the end of December of this year that you are going to move out at the end of February, which is the end of that fixed term. If you don't choose to move out at that time and next February comes around or it's coming close, the landlord may invite you to sign a new lease, uh, may invite or may urge, and I would advise not to do so. Because if you do, that binds you into a new fixed term, which is good for the landlord, but not good for you. And there's no legal obligation. Uh, what the law says is that if a fixed term lease comes to an end and it's not terminated by either party, it continues on a month to month basis. So let's go back a year. If somebody entered into a lease on March 1st, 2020, that said that it was until February 28th, 2021, well, guess what? That's, that's this coming Sunday. Uh, if neither party terminates that lease, it doesn't mean that the lease is up and the tenant has to move out. It does not mean that at all. In fact, it means the opposite. It means that even though the lease says that, you know, the term is until February 28th, 2021, and that date passes, the, the tenant C continues. The tenant goes on living there on what is implied to be a month to month basis. And the tenant could be living there in 2027 20, with a lease that said it was until February 2021. That's just fine. Continues on a month to month basis until it's terminated by either party in accordance with the law. So that is what to do, first of all, not to sign any new lease and enter into any new fixed term. Instead, to uh, continue on a month to month basis, because then as a tenant, then you have the right anytime to terminate on 60 days notice from the end of a rental period. So you wouldn't wait until say March 17th and say, ah, oh, I'm gonna give 60 days notice. I'm gonna move out on what, May 16th. Is that 60 days? No, you can't do that. But on March 17th, if you decide you wanna move out, you can give notice then or any time up until March 31st, that you're terminating as of May 30th. So notice as of the end of any subsequent rental period, usually a month, but not always, uh, on 60 days notice, meaning that it will end 60 days thereafter, which the law typically interprets as four months. So like I say, you can give notice anytime in March, it's effective as of the end of March, that the notice uh, is 60 days uh, termination thereafter being the end of May. Um, if a tenancy clearly in the lease says that uh, it's from say the 10th of each month, well then that's fine. You pay rent every 10th of the month. The tenancy is until the 9th of the following month. If the lease clearly states that, then sure, uh, you could give notice on March 9th that the tenancy is ending May the 9th, but only if the 10th of the month is stated in the lease to be the beginning of the rental period. If, as is usually the case, it's the first of the month, you give the notice prior to the end of a month and it's effective the end of two months later. There are the other ways that a tenant may terminate a lease is by an order of the landlord and tenant board. And as I mentioned before, in talking about the post dated checks, a tenant may apply to the landlord and tenant board for an order for early termination. You know, if things are really bad, uh, in some situations, a um, tenant may apply to the landlord and tenant board and say, the, the repairs are so, you know, there, there are so many things that are in, in disrepair and the landlord's not repairing them or repairing them so poorly, or uh, there are things the landlord can't repair or have, has tried and there's a uh, uh, bed bug infestation or ceiling leaks or any, any number of things, uh, or sometimes abuse on the part of the landlord, which can be, or abuse by the tenants that the landlord just lets happen. In any of those situations, a tenant may apply 
to the landlord and tenant board and say, uh, I signed this lease and it's until whatever date, let's say uh, August 31st. It's now February 23rd and uh, actually, I said, I said 24th. Uh, and um, I am filing today saying that I would like the board to order this tenancy terminated prior to the date the lease says being August 31st. Well, the landlord and tenant board doesn't agree to that easily. They're convinced of serious you know, uh, circumstances. They have the right and they do sometimes and they will give their reasons as to why. And they will say that this lease that says that it expires August 31st, we the, the landlord and tenant board order that this tenancy is terminated as of, it could be today's date, as of February 24th, 2021, irrespective of the fact that the lease says August 31st, because of the reasons that the landlord and tenant uh, board states in its order. And sometimes that can even be retroactive. I have a, I've assisted students sometimes when they have seen no option but to move out of a place. And um, sometimes the landlord will say, fine, go and I'll agree. Other times it has to go to the landlord and tenant board and the landlord and tenant board sometimes might, you know, sit there today and say, yeah, the tenant uh, moved on January 15th. Well, uh, we hereby order that the, uh, that the tenancy was terminated as of January 15th, 2021. Even though we're sitting here now in late February, the board has the right to do that. And then the consequence of that is that the board will order what rent is paid or what refund is owed or other things all around the termination date that the board orders if the circumstances have justified that. So like I say, a tenant may terminate if they get an order of the landlord and tenant board. Sometimes uh, city inspectors, they can have city inspectors in who find that a unit is, uh, is not up to fire code or building code uh, like low ceilings or insufficient uh, uh, fire exits. So in those uh, situations as well, I have, or if it uh, violates zoning regulations. So in all of those situations as well, I have helped students to get out of tenancy sometimes. A uh, student may also sublet or assign uh, a tenancy and sublet means that they that the, that the tenant remains the tenant, but they sublet to a subtenant while they, the tenant, don't live there, but they're still officially the tenant. There's just a subtenant living. Assignment is when the tenant actually assigns the tenancy to another tenant, and then the existing tenant is out of it entirely. The lease is assigned and the assignee, the new tenant to whom it's assigned, takes over and becomes the only tenant. And that's the difference between a sub-tenancy uh, and an assignment. And in either case, uh, it's up to a tenant to find that person to sublet to or to assign to. And they, uh, they must get the landlord's consent. The landlord's consent uh, may not be withheld unreasonably meaning it can only be withheld if there's a valid reason. For instance, if a proposed new tenant doesn't have a source of income, a, uh, a, a landlord may refuse the subject or assignment for that reason, but only for valid grounds like that, their consent may not be unreasonably withheld. Now, I also mentioned here with the landlord's consent, one, well, that is a whole different situation. That By that, I mean sometimes uh, a landlord will agree to terminate a lease upon the tenant's request, even without a subtenant or an assignee lined up. Uh, why would that happen? Well, a couple of main reasons. One would be if the tenant had a valid reason to move out. And I talked before about the reasons why the landlord and tenant board might issue an order for early termination. If a landlord knows that a tenant has grounds and that the landlord and tenant board would likely issue an order for early termination, and there's a strong possibility uh, or of uh, an order for early termination or at least a drastic rent reduction, 
the landlord might say, well, rather than to fight that at the landlord and tenant board and lose and have to pay the tenant's cost and stuff, the landlord, as I said before, might say, fine, go, I'll let you out of the lease because I know you're going to be right out anyway by the board. So I'll let you out of the lease. And that is one situation in which the landlord may consent. Another situation is if really the landlord's done nothing wrong, but I mentioned before about uh, if a tenant loses a job or drops out of school, uh, if they have to go home and look after a sick relative, well, none of those situations are the landlord's fault under law, and none of them give the tenant the automatic right to terminate the lease. But a landlord may say, you know what, I'm not going to get paid. Yes, you still owe me, and no, I don't have to let you out of it. But I can see under the circumstances, it's going to be hard to find you after you move out. You're not going to have an income or assets that I can uh, enforce a judgment against. So better that I, as the landlord, find a new tenant, even if I lose a month's or so rent. In those situations, out of kind of compassion, a landlord may consent to a tenant terminating early. And I say kind of compassion, because like I say, it's also the landlord's best interest. They know it's not going to be worth chasing that person. Getting an order from the landlord and tenant board for rent or arrears that they can never enforce anyway. So, uh, but in those situations, it, uh, it does take approaching the landlord with open hands, meaning uh, putting your cards on the table and, and saying, here's the reality and can we talk about uh, what's really in everyone's best interest here. So those are the ways that a tenant may be able to terminate a lease. And we can move on to the next slide, which is when can a landlord terminate a lease? So a landlord may only terminate for three reasons. First, as a result of default on the tenant's part. And this is, I, I should have had this. Um, so as a result of a tenant's fault, meaning a default on the tenant's part. And that would be the best example being if the tenant doesn't pay the rent. Another example would be if a tenant violates rules like is uh, noisy or dirty on an ongoing basis or uh, conducts illegal activities on the premises. In any of those situations, a, a, a landlord may terminate uh, they have to go through a procedure, give a notice first, and then arrange a hearing and ask the board. But the board, upon evidence, will agree with the landlord in those situations and uh, will order a tenancy terminated. Non-payment of rent or habitual late payment, excessive noise, not following rules, disturbing other tenants. So that's what the first bullet point means. Uh, uh, default on the tenant's part, uh, these things that are the tenant's own fault. Second reason is if the landlord or the landlord's immediate family intend to live there. And in that situation, there is a form that a the landlord has to use and serve on a tenant. Uh, they also, uh, it must be legitimate, I can't just say it. And this is a big issue because uh, tenants often receive notices from landlords saying that, well, I require you to move out because I or my family intend to live there. And tenants can sometimes be suspicious. I've dealt with two of these situations in the past week. Uh, they're ongoing, they're not you know, resolved overnight, but certainly situations where tenants have received that form and question whether the landlord is really being honest about it. Um, <clears throat> so it's only valid if the landlord is honest about it. And the landlord must either move the tenant to another unit at the landlord's expense, if there is one, maybe there is, often there isn't, usually there isn't, uh, or uh, pay the tenant one month's rent, uh, like the, the amount that the 
tenant usually pays the landlord for rent for a month. The landlord must pay the tenant that amount in addition to giving the proper form and it being sincere. If a uh, tenant receives that form and even the month's rent and moves out and later finds out that it, was, uh, it wasn't done in good faith and that the landlord did not actually move in, he, he just uh, rented to another tenant who's now paying more, and even after the fact, even after that uh, first tenant has moved out, that tenant can apply to the landlord and tenant board with the evidence and say, you know, I moved out upon receiving this notice, look what's happening now, and the landlord and tenant board will order that the landlord pay damages to that tenant for uh, having given the form in bad faith. A landlord may also give that form if the landlord has sold the premises and the new owner or the new owner's family intends to move in. Now, if a landlord sells a property where there are tenants, that does not automatically end the tenancy. The new owner buys it subject to the fact that there's a tenant. The new owner likewise can only uh, have the tenant move out if the new owner sincerely intends to live there. And uh, in that situation, if the new owner wants to uh, buy first with the tenant and then move in later, fine. Then that new owner gives the notice in due course after uh, becoming the owner. But if the new owner wants to move in as soon as they buy, then the old owner is the one who gives the notice to the existing tenants. Again, it has to be valid, it has to be true. There is not an obligation then for the tenant to receive a month's free rent. But everything else is the same in terms of the form and in terms of being true. And uh, that is the second reason, is if all of that is genuine. The third reason if the, is if the landlord intends to do major renovations. And I've dealt with this situation frequently as well. Um, there are valid times when there need to be repairs made and a uh, landlord may give a tenant notice saying that I need to come in and repair leaks or whatever and, uh, and to do that in part of the premises. And if the repairs that need to be done are such that they can be done with the tenant still living there, then that is what the landlord is required to do is to uh, give the tenant notice of entry, but to do the repairs with the tenant still living there. If the repairs are such that they can't reasonably be done with the tenant living there, this is when the landlord has the right to give the notice that the tenancy is terminated because of these repairs that need to be done. That's fine as long as that is legitimate. And I have dealt with situations, well, well, I've, I've dealt with situations where a tenant received that notice and the tenant said, well, no, I, this can be done with me living here. It's not difficult. It, it, it's not to the degree that I would have to move out. And again, when we talk about uh, repairs or renovations that are done, there's all kinds of combinations of that. So neither I nor the landlord or tenant or the landlord and tenant board or the government could set rules that apply to every situation. Every, every repair is different and it's not automatically clear uh, in many cases whether a tenant can reasonably live there or not. And uh, the landlord and the tenant may validly have different views on that. And it may be up to the landlord and tenant board to make an order as to whether, yes, the tenancy may be terminated for that reason or no, it may not be. And uh, so we do see abuses of this sometimes where a landlord uh, wants to do renovations and they uh, terminate a, a uh, tenancy and they don't really do things that would have required the tenant to vacate, but then they're able to turn around and rent to someone else at a higher rent. 
And that's sometimes casually referred to as a renoviction. Uh, there, are, there are such abuses. It is legal for a landlord to genuinely do major uh, renovations that are reasonably uh, required or are reasonable to do, even just because of the age of certain things within the premises, the condition. And uh, if a tenancy is terminated and a landlord genuinely does major renovations, the landlord has the right to re-rent and has the right to do so at a higher rent. But uh, it has to all be genuine in terms of uh, having made enough repairs or renovations that the tenancy really had to be terminated for the landlord to make them. If the landlord isn't really doing much, then the abuse can lie where a landlord gives that notice, gets rid of a tenant, doesn't really do much or certainly anything that couldn't be done with a tenant living there, and then turns around and rents to somebody else at a higher rent. Uh, that is a situation that a tenant may challenge, but it can be difficult to do so. Uh, the best thing is to, in that case, is to challenge it upon receiving the notice and say, well, what do you, the landlord, really intend to do? Have a discussion as to whether the tenant can reasonably be living there while that's taking place or not. And I've been part of those discussions. Um, what else can happen? Well, is if a tenant uh, does move out, although it's harder in this situation, uh, a tenant may challenge it after the fact. Going back to that second reason about the landlord or the landlord's family living there, that can be more black and white, either they are or they're not. And it may be easier for a former tenant to challenge that after they've moved out. Um, that can be hard enough to prove, but if you can prove it, like I say, it either is or it isn't. Uh, in terms of the major renovations, that is can be harder to prove for a land uh, for a tenant uh, after the fact. But if they can really, if they have photographs or anything, and they challenge the landlord, and the landlord can't show evidence, uh, uh, invoices from contractors or invoices for supplies or uh, photographs to show the changes. Um, it can be, it is theoretically possible for a tenant to challenge that as well if he's moved out and then shows that the landlord really didn't make very major renovations, not enough to justify having moved their former, their former tenant out. The former tenant may be entitled to damages. But again, it's a matter of proving those things. And we can move on. I talked before about uh, units that the city inspectors might shut down, might declare illegal and require tenants to move out of well, whether they want to or not. And uh, so uh, building codes, um, I, for instance, not having a fan or a window in the washroom or sufficient fire exits or uh, uh, smoke alarms, uh, having low ceilings, uh, <clears throat> improper, like unfinished floors or um, improper, like walls, like just uh, temporary walls. There are different things that don't satisfy building codes or other bylaws. Bylaws, well, some places it's not legal to have a basement apartment, for example, or, or any um, additional rental unit in a single family dwelling. So in those situations, a rental unit is illegal. And like I say, city inspectors may come and say this is illegal. And another is if there are more people living in a space than is legally permitted, and every city has a maximum on, on that as well, uh, how many people can be living there per square foot, especially like under a rental situation. And I have helped people to, uh, I, I have helped students who are living in situations where there were way too many students renting and paying uh, to live in premises of, uh, of that size. And 
so all of those situations, we just kind of made a, an, an additional point of uh, accentuating our illegal situations and they can be addressed. And uh, certainly I have helped students who are, who are in those situations to do so. And uh, sometimes a tenant doesn't, doesn't necessarily feel they have anywhere else to go and they might kind of like to stay, but if they're being taken advantage of in those ways, uh, it's better to try to find somewhere else to go. And with the government authorities like the, the bylaw inspectors, other city inspectors, it is possible to have a tenancy declared illegal and uh, again, the landlord can't do anything. The tenant can move out and say, regardless of what a written agreement says, we can talk about August or whatever, but guess what? Uh, the city inspector said, as of today in February, this is not legal. I'm gone. I don't owe you any more rent and you owe me back for uh, what I've already prepaid. And I have helped students in those situations. A tenant should have tenant's insurance. Some leases uh, explicitly require it, others may not, but it's always wise for a tenant to have tenant's insurance. And there are two things that uh, the tenant's insurance cover. First of all, is the tenant's own personal property in the event of damage, destruction, or theft. People think sometimes that if they're renting at a place and there is a theft or a fire and their own computer or clothing or jewelry are destroyed or stolen, well, hopefully the landlord has insurance. Well, yeah, the landlord will have insurance, but it won't cover those things. Uh, if the tenant, if the, if the landlord is not to blame for those things, then the landlord's insurance will not cover it. And uh, this is by one of the things then that tenant's insurance does cover is, as I said, the tenant's own personal property in any of those events. Um, but the other then is to cover liability resulting from the tenant's negligence. And <clears throat> if a tenant, for instance, leaves water running and it spills over and causes damage, it may cause damage beyond the tenant's own unit. For instance, in a high rise, it may, you know, um, flow down into another unit or even uh, in any kind of building, it, it may, it will certainly cause damage within the tenant's own unit. It may cause damage beyond, is, is what I'm saying. Likewise, leaving an element on or anything like that that causes a fire, a candle that, you know, knocked over, whatever. Um, if a tenant causes that, again, damage to the unit that the tenant is renting, and in many cases, well beyond that, they can run into tens of thousands of dollars or more for which the tenant can be liable. Um, also, if the tenant leaves a hazard of any kind, such as a spill that someone slips and falls on or anything that a tenant, uh, that, that anyone else trips over, any of those situations uh, of a tenant's own negligence that cause damage either uh, to property or to people who are injured, a tenant can be liable for. So these are the reasons why every tenant should have tenant's insurance to cover their own personal property and even more potentially uh, costly, their own liability in the event of them doing anything that uh, causes damage to property or to other people's health. So I do recommend uh, that whether or not a lease explicitly requires it. And we can move on. Yes, that's where I thought we were now. So there is my email address, legal at mycaesar.ca. That is forwarded to my personal Gmail and I would reply from my own Gmail. That's just fine. Uh, so I, and, and normally I've been on campus uh, to meet with uh, CSER members on Tuesday afternoons into the evening over the past almost a year and counting. I'm available by email and I'm available every day of the week. 
uh, forget you know about it being Tuesdays, any day of the week. Here I am talking to you today on a Wednesday. Any day of the week, uh, a CSER member may email me, and uh, all consultations are being conducted via email. But that's working very well. We discuss the situation, and uh, we send links. We can do documents back and forth as attachments. And uh, as Janet mentioned, sometimes documents need to be notarized. If documents need to be notarized in person, I am making arrangements to do that in one location or another with appropriate uh, precautions. So at any time, the bottom line is uh, that uh, season members may email me at that email address and I will get back to you fairly promptly. I believe Corey and anybody else will tell you that I am pretty quick in answering email. So Corey, you're back with us. Awesome. Well, thank you so well, much, Bill. So oh, I'm getting some feedback. There he goes. Thank you uh, for for the presentation. I, I know that uh, some members uh, have some questions. So if anyone does have any questions, feel free to throw them up. Uh, if you're joining on Zoom, uh, ask on Zoom. If you are following us on Facebook, ask on Facebook. There is a slight delay, so we will get to it. Um, before, uh, as, as folks are writing those questions, uh, just wanted to let uh, people know that, like, yes, Bill is here. Please access him. He's uh, a wonderful help for me whenever I have any questions for, for my own stuff uh, and for, for other students who come in. So don't feel like you have to just rely on online sources for legal advice. Um, but when you are looking for that stuff, Precursor, uh, we do recommend uh, folks go and check out the Advocacy Center for Tenants uh, of Ontario. Obviously, in your different, if you're in a different province, there's different versions of this uh, not-for-profit uh, in every province. Uh, and if you're joining from another country in, in different states or, or countries or whatever you might have, there's usually a group like this. They have a wonderful resource page that uh, we have here, uh, but it's pretty easy if you type it into Google. They also do have an update on Bill uh, 184. Uh, which is a provincial government bill um, that was dealing with some of the, the, the tenants' rights issues uh, and landlord issues um, that uh, the provincial government has decided uh, to implement. Uh, so you can find a very detailed response in terms of some of the good things, but also some of the concerning things with that bill. Um, uh, another uh, area of support is to go to Steps to Justice, uh, which has uh, a pretty good breakdown in terms of what to expect. Uh, with uh, legal processes uh, and the, the, the processes that Bill was talking about. So um, certainly access Bill. Uh, feel free to look through this website uh, and uh, obviously also ask Bill uh, questions for follow-up because some of it can be very legal heavy uh, and might not apply to every situation. Uh, and then we also thought we'd share uh, Renovations TO, which is um, a site that hosts uh, some of the known uh, areas and buildings that are currently doing run evictions. And, uh, you know, if something is happening to you, it might not just be happening to you. So you can, uh, it's a way of connecting with other organizers uh, and, and people facing uh, what you're facing uh, and using that peer support. Um, so I do see some questions here. So we'll uh, go uh, to the Q&A first. Um, what if we are behind our rent, but try to pay off the amount? Is it possible to terminate the lease and vacate with a, a payment plan in place. For example, we move but automatically deposit every month to pay off the remaining amount of rent. The short answer is yes. Uh, it's a matter of uh, engaging the landlord in a discussion about that. Obviously, the landlord would be aware that the rent is behind and the landlord would then have the right, as I said before, to apply to the landlord and tenant board uh, for an order uh, for termination. And if the landlord takes that step, the landlord will also have the right to ask for interest and the, the, the uh, filing fee to the landlord and tenant board, all of which only add more to what the tenant is going to be asked to pay in the end. So it is absolutely wise to approach the landlord and discuss the situation that uh, I'm not able to continue paying this rent for whatever reason. Uh, in that situation, the tenant should certainly try to find someone to take over the lease. The landlord may have someone, may have like a waiting list, but don't count on it. Uh, and whatever else, if, if uh, you're able to come to terms in that respect as to someone else moving in, 
taking over the lease going forward, there is still the issue that in the, in the question about uh, outstanding rent, and yes, it is possible to negotiate and say, well, here's how much I can realistically pay per month. I owe a total amount of arrears of X amount. Well, I can pay this amount each month over whatever number of months to pay that off. Uh, the landlord may say that's fine or may say no, but the landlord won't, there won't be much the landlord can do either because even if the landlord goes to the landlord and tenant board and gets an order, the landlord and tenant board can't order someone to pay faster than they can, than they can afford to pay and they won't. So the landlord would look foolish in that respect uh, and would be better to agree to accept a payment plan that they do believe is the best that the tenant can offer. And I could certainly assist someone in that situation in uh, that negotiation with the landlord and that effort to prevent the landlord from going to the landlord and tenant board and only increasing everybody's costs. Corey, did that seem to cover the... Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think so, but uh, if there's a follow-up, oh, I see that there's, oh, uh, thank you. Okay, thank you uh, for that question. Uh, so we have another question here. Uh, what are landlords allowed to ask for and not allowed to ask for when reviewing applications? In terms of what they're allowed to ask for, uh, they have the right to know the applicant's name and income source. Like they do have the right to ask about employment, or in the absence of employment to ask for a guarantor, which may be a, a parent or a, uh, someone else who can uh, agree to cover rent in the event that the tenant's not able to. But that information, like the identity of the applicant and the income source, not a social insurance number, uh, but references they may ask for, like they may ask, uh, where have you lived previously? And uh, they may ask, can you give us a, a previous landlord's name? Someone may not have rented before and may not have any references to provide, and that's, that's fine. Uh, they may not choose to give references, and sometimes that's because there was maybe a bad experience. It wasn't the tenant's fault. Uh, and a but a, a, a prospective new landlord does have the right to ask for references. They just can't be unreasonable in refusing a tenant on that basis. And that's where it becomes tricky. Um, a, a, that can be abused as well by a landlord where although they have the legal right to ask for references, they may ask for references from one person and maybe turn that person down based on the references or there's they wouldn't ask references from someone else. And that can be for reasons including discrimination that's prohibited uh, under the Ontario Human Rights Code. So uh, I, I only say that to say that there are nuances, but fundamentally ident uh, uh, identity, income information to show that you can afford the unit and they may ask for references uh, uh, within reason, not, as I said, a social insurance number um, and uh, not other uh, per personal factors that could lead to violations of the Human Rights Code. Mm -hmm. Thank Corey, you for that. that. Yeah, yeah I, I think that that makes sense. Uh, one of the things actually to follow up on that is uh, can they ask about pet information? Because I know well, that there's been a number of people who've asked us about that. <laughs> well, they they should they they should not be on the basis that pets generally cannot be prohibited. The problem is that certain pets may be. So um, as we as you may know, if a lease has a provision against pets, that is not enforceable, generally speaking. And the, we talked about the new standard form of lease and that addresses that, uh, that uh, our rules against pets generally cannot be enforced. So if, if a landlord asks about pets, really 
a, a tenant doesn't have to answer and it, and a landlord should not be refusing them on that basis. Mm -hmm. However, I realize that uh, a landlord may be tempted to refuse, and that you know that gets into that, that that might have to force the discussion that I don't have a pet, but I may have in the in the future, and I do have a right to have a legal pet, or I do have a pet, but it is legal. So my answer is yes, but you may not. Uh, Turn me down on that basis. Having said that, there are certain pets that are, it isn't legal to have, and uh, you know, so you wouldn't be able to move in with a pet that is not legal to even have in a property that you own, mm -hmm. and then uh, attempt to rely upon the government's um, statement that pets may not be excluded. So again, there are nuances, and. Uh, the bottom line is that yes, you can have a legal pet or you can choose to have one later on and the landlord can't turn you down for that reason. And having said that, all I can say is that if anyone is in a situation where they're applying and they're having to deal with that, let me know and I'll help you through it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, like I, I know that I've, I've run into friends who has like been denied because they have a pet and then the landlord just magically has some type of allergies and it's a split unit kind of place. Um, and, and just like kind of getting into that like little nuance and, and trying to find whichever ways, but it's, it's good to know that it's not actually an inherently denial, like something that you have to Correct. provide. So because also, if I may interrupt, also service animals is something else. And again, I was, I was saying about the things I'm presently doing with, I'm presently dealing with a situation of a landlord having an issue with a service animal. Mm -hmm. uh, trust me, I've, I, <laughs> I've dealt with everything. And, um, and sometimes it's a matter of tenants having, again, tenants having an issue, but then I've, you know, when well, the landlord says, oh, well, it's the tenant who has the issue with it. And uh, the tenant with the service animal speaks to the other tenant. Oh, no, I don't have an issue with it. Well, who is telling the truth? Because it's also, I mean, the, the, the landlord in that situation may be lying, but it's also like the other tenant may have complained to the landlord about the service animal and then to the face of the roommate with the service animal say, oh, no, I didn't. So it isn't, it isn't always a landlord who's, who's uh, lying either. Just comes back to every situation is different and that's why uh, you know, I really try to deal with every situation individually. And again, I'm, I'm happy to answer these questions, but that's why we put my email address up as well. People who's, who don't necessarily want to discuss the, uh, the details of their situation by way of a public question like this are welcome to email me. Uh, or even if we talk about it, you know, to follow up by email. But uh, because every situation is different and I have seen so many, I'd be tempted to say I've seen them all, except every day or at least every few days, I see ones I haven't seen before. So even I can't say that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you though. Uh, I don't see any other questions uh, and we are getting close to the end of the time. So I think, uh, are there any other questions? The other, no, okay. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we did want to just uh, end on is just talking uh, about, uh, you know, we're, we're here talking about landlords and, and tenants uh, and rights, and there are a number of people who uh, don't have access um, to uh, housing uh, and shelter. So uh, as some folks might have been seeing this pop up on their newsfeed for the past week. Uh, some people might have been seeing it pop up for the past many years. Uh, but uh, there is a current action happening uh, for Justice for Kilio uh, Shivrite, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, uh, which is uh, they are an organizer, uh, a builder, a constructor who is uh, building tiny shelters um, in city parks uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, so uh, Maddie uh, just shared uh, the GoFundMe uh, to support the tiny shelters. Um, and essentially the, the city of Toronto has uh, filed an injunction 
Uh, they indicated that they aren't suing uh, Kilio, but they are trying to stop uh, Kilio from putting up new shelters, from moving them around, and also going in and making repairs, which is primarily what Kilio is doing right now. He, uh, they've been putting up shelters across um, the, the, the city uh, for the past while now, providing a very necessary service for people, you know, who aren't able to attain a shelter bed, who don't feel safe staying in a shelter uh, because COVID restrictions are, are hard to enforce there, uh, or who've been kicked out of a shelter or hotel and have no other option. Uh, and they've been doing this, I think, since September uh, 2020. So there's a lot out there to kind of find. Uh, the, a lot of it is in uh, the chat right now. Please go and check that out. Uh, become educated on it. Uh, share it if you have the funds to donate. Uh, to support uh, the maintenance of some of these shelters, please do. Uh, if you have uh, the ability to sign a petition, please do. Uh, and most importantly, if you have the ability to contact your city councilor uh, or member of provincial parliament, uh, please do, because um, those are the areas where uh, we can really try to address homelessness uh, and why Kaleo is doing the work that they're doing in terms of building these shelters, um, because uh, no one else is thinking about these realities or, or, or creating that urgent justice that needs to happen because people need places to live. Um, so check that out. Uh, I don't know if there's anything I missed there, Maddie. I think that's perfect. I was also going to bring up um, Khalil's uh, tiny shelters. If you can please sign the petition, it's really uh, important that we support um, somebody who really stepped up, as Corey said, to do something um, when the city of Toronto was really negligent and has been for every winter we know, um, and in the summer too, but especially during the winter um, in Toronto. Uh, and we've seen really the outcome of that with the explosion of the homelessness or houselessness crisis in Toronto. Um, uh, during COVID uh, and people fleeing the shelters uh, uh, from, from COVID infections and um, um, from the lack of privacy and other issues that have been associated with shelters for a while. Um, so that's really important if you can please sign the petition. Um, and I'm also going to drop another resource. Um, so Corey had a bunch of great resources there. So thank you. Um, I'm going to drop another one here. It's Toronto COVID evictions. So kind of a similar map that Corey had on the other page about run evictions, but this is specifically tracking um, people who are evicted during COVID. So you can check if your landlord's on there. And if you've experienced some kind of difficulty with them, maybe this is something that their other tenants are also experiencing. So you can see that there. You can also report if you know something that is happening. And I'm also going to leave a link here to a Facebook page called People's Defense. And you can also follow them on Twitter. And they've been doing really great organizing during COVID uh, in terms of neighbors showing up for each other. Uh, in my neighborhood, there was a, also a group, a large group of tenants who were being evicted um, and the community was able to mobilize in some ways to attend the landlord uh, tenant board hearings um, and to also get people into those meetings if they were missing those meetings to contact each other's neighbors. And you can kind of see the community actions and get involved in that through the Facebook page or their Twitter. Um, and if you want to keep talking about tenants' issues uh, at Ryerson or with the Chang School, you can email me. I'm vp.equity at mycaesar.ca. I'll put that there. And you are invited to our equity and campaigns committee where we can talk about things uh, like tenants' rights. So I'll leave that there. And thank you so much for uh, coming and to Bill for doing this uh, amazing and really important workshop. Uh, and uh... I think that we're really at the end of the time here, uh, but uh, just a reminder uh, for anyone who needs tax support, uh, there is information on our website. You can find all of this information around UFile, which is a free tax filing service uh, through the Canadian Federation of Students. Uh, we do have a number of upcoming workshops uh, happening in the next few weeks. So uh, we have a, an, a, a mentorship series happening next week around technology and education during COVID-19. Um, we have uh, two sessions on financial aid, uh, one around uh, RRSPs and, TF and the other on TFSAs. Uh, so if you're uh, a student thinking about uh, how you're going to be able to actually do those investments and, and that kind of personal banking, we have some intro introductory ses uh, sessions that we are organizing this month and next month, or March and, and April. Uh, and then we also have uh, the next session with uh, Bill, 
uh, around uh, student debt uh, and legal uh, issues and, and supports that we can provide at CSER um, and through Bill uh, for, for legal aid uh, around student debt on March uh, 23rd. These are all up on our website, so you can RSVP um, to make sure that you get the links. Uh, and we also have our Black History Month uh, events happening this week and next week. Check those out. Uh, and I think that that's the end. Uh, thank you so much, Bill, for being here uh, and for thank all you. the work that you do for students across this province. Uh, uh, we really appreciate you spending that time with us today and giving us your insight. Everyone have a good day. Awesome. Thanks, Bill. Take care.